Well, everybody's set. Great. Hello and welcome to my presentation. This is going to be about browser hijacking via cross-site scripting. So first of all, let me introduce myself shortly. My name is Daniel Fabian. Um, I work for Seconsult uh, Unternehmensberatung GmbH here in Vienna. And I do mostly penetration testing and also some consulting stuff like ISO 27000 uh, and so. But my heart is actually in penetration testing. I like it better to sit in front of a computer hacking instead of presenting before management. Actually, this is kind of a large audience for me, so please bear with me if I'm a little bit nervous. Um, just a couple of details about my company. We were founded in 2002 in Austria. We have branch offices here in Vienna, and we were founded in uh, Wiener Neustadt, where we still have an office. And some years ago, we also uh, opened up a branch office in Montreal, Canada. And starting next year, we'll also be in Germany. Well, we are focused completely on information security. Uh, we don't sell any software or hardware which makes us <clears throat> independent from vendors. So whenever we find security flaw in um, a product, we don't have to uh, fear that the vendor is going to be a problem for us. Uh, we're completely independent. We're specialized in security audits, especially with web applications uh, and basically all kinds of other uh, services. And security coaching, a big step for us was we developed the ONR17700, uh, which is an Austrian standard or some kind of standard. We developed it together with the Austrian Standards Institute. And it's about web application security. Um, how to, it's, it states the minimum requirements for making a web application secure, the requirements the application needs to fulfill in order to be secure from SQL injection, cross-site scripting, and file inclusion, whatever. Um, it is also certifiable, so if you have a web application, you want to make sure it is secure, you can certify it according to this standard. Um, this requires a source code audit, so after the audit you can be pretty sure that there are most flaws uh, have been found. We can't name most of our clients because we respect their the right to um, refuse to take, uh, to, to let uh, us take them as reference in order to protect them from hackers like you. Uh, so not to attract them, some uh, customers we, we may name are, for example, the European Central Bank, Austrian National Bank, Monday Packages, Austrian Lotteries, or OMW here in Austria. All right, so what can you expect from this presentation? Basically, it's all going to be about cross-site scripting. Cross-site scripting has been around for a while, actually like a decade or something like that. Uh, but I served the full disclosure archive uh, a couple of days ago, and there's still practically every day or almost every day uh, some cross-site scripting posted. For example, uh, I found one uh, that was published about the site of the Bank of America, um, where you should expect some security but you just need to take the parameter msg, uh, add some JavaScript, and it's going to be executed. Another cross-site scripting is someone found and published on full disclosures, for example, in How to Forge, and I don't know if any banking forks are present uh, that know Fish Market. It's uh, a page that has specialized in finding cross-site scripting uh, in other web pages. They published for basically every major bank in Austria and Germany, cross-site scripting vulnerabilities. It's a little bit old, the page, but um, it hasn't been updated for a while, but uh, there's still vulnerabilities open and have been found in uh, mid-2006, and the affected companies still haven't been able to fix the, the vulnerability. All right, so, some of you may probably think cross-site scripting, well, actually, this is boring. Everybody hates it when someone posts it, uh, cross-site scripting flaws on uh, mailing lists like full disclosure or bug track or whatever. Um, I found one particularly interesting posting, which is not so old, posted by Repex on uh, November 11. Um, it's called On uh, Cross-Site Scripting and Its Technical Merits. Basically, it's an article uh, questioning if 
uh, cross-site scripting has a place on mailing lists like full disclosure or bug track. The reasoning behind the article is cross-site scripting isn't technical no matter how it's used according to the author. Um, people who use cross-site scripting on pen tests, real hacking, anything but phishing are lame and can't write real exploits where real exploits are defined as non-web or other web bugs like SQL injection and stuff. Um, and well, publishing cross-site scripting shows your weakness. Well, while I agree on the last part, cross uh, publishing cross-site scripting shows your weakness um, because I think you should at least uh, give the, the webmaster of defected page a chance to remove the uh, cross-site scripting vulnerability before uh, publishing it. Um, I think cross-site scripting indeed still has a place on mailing lists like full disclosure. Um, it cannot be as easily exploited as other web bugs like for example uh, SQL injection. The thing is that with SQL injection uh, you are actually attacking the server. And the server is always there. It will always give you uh, your response. So when you find a, an SQL injection vulnerability, you type in your SQL statement. Um, and basically, immediately, you get the response from uh, the server. You get the content of the database. You get the usernames and passwords, whatever the vulnerability is about. With cross-site scripting, it's not quite as simple. Um, Cross-site scripting requires at least some kind of user interaction because you don't attack the server itself. Even though the vulnerability is on the server, you are attacking, in fact, the client. The client uh, needs to visit the page, for example, where your JavaScript is loaded or they need to click on a link. So the results from this vulnerability isn't as instant as with other web bugs, which is uh, why I think that some people think of cross-site scripting as boring because they need to do more work work. They need to send out phishing mails, for example, um, in most cases anyway, or they uh, need to play some JavaScript statically on a page. Some fun cross-site scripting that uh, I'm not sure anyone has ever tried. I didn't, but I just made the, um, the scan for, uh, for this presentation. You just fill out um, a transfer sheet and wire some money to some of your friends or not so much friends, whatever. And uh, as note to the payee, you include some JavaScript. What happens when you uh, file this sheet is probably someone is going to enter the, um, the text that is on the note to the payee, which is, in our case, some JavaScript, which is loaded from a server, which is located somewhere in Florida. Um, and the cross-site scripting uh, is loaded and does some bad stuff to your online banking when the uh, user uh, has logs into his online banking account and uh, has a look at the transactions and the money he got. You want to know why I know that this server is located in Florida? Well, actually we hacked this server. And I don't think the guy that owns the server mines because he was already arrested by Lieutenant Kane from CSI Miami, uh, as this screenshot shows. <laughs> All right, so seriously though, what is cross-site scripting about anyway? Basically, there's two different kinds of cross-site scripting. Um, one cool cross-site scripting and one not so cool cross-site scripting. It's permanent cross-site scripting. This is the cool kind because you can store the JavaScript on the server. Um, you inject some scripting code. It's mostly JavaScript, but it can actually be anything. It can be objects like Flash, uh, applets, or just plain HTML, whatever, into the web application. The application stores the JavaScript, and whenever a user surfs on the page, the JavaScript is loaded. This is mostly found in applications like forums, for example, or webmail applications, or file uploads. Uh, a funny example is, for example, did you ever see one of those online recruitment portals <coughs> where people can apply online and mostly there is also a possibility to upload files like your CV and whatever. Uh, sometimes they just allow PDF, but sometimes also pages like HTML are allowed, so you can upload your CV in uh, HTML. 
Well, what happens when someone uploads an HTML file with some JavaScript is probably some time after you file your application, someone from the HR department is going to have a look at your application, load the files that you have been uh, uploading, and the JavaScript is executed, which is actually pretty comfortable because then you even have the user account of an administrator, can steal the cookie, uh, and get access to their backends. The second type of cross-site scripting is temporary cross-site scripting. Uh, this is where the scripting code is injected on the fly and it requires way more user interaction than the permanent cross-site scripting type. The reason is that mostly you use the HTTP GET parameter uh, to inject JavaScript, it, but it can be basically anything. It can be cookies, headers, post parameters, whatever you are able to man manipulate uh, on the, on the uh, response from the server. So um, in this case, as already mentioned, user interaction is required. Uh, I made the example of, uh, at the beginning of the presentation with the Bank of America uh, cross-site scripting. This is a typical temporary cross-site scripting because the message tag needs to be used to uh, inject the JavaScript. So in order to largely exploit such a cross-site scripting, you need to craft, for example, phishing mails and send them out to millions of users and hope that some users will be stupid enough to click on your link and the JavaScript is executed. Another way is, for example, just posting your link to a forum, and when someone hits the link, the JavaScript is also executed. So with cross-site scripting, you can have some fun. I collected a couple of ways uh, or fun things to do with JavaScript. Uh, one of my favorites is always webmail, because webmail has the advantage that most webmail clients or, or servers, whatever you call them, um, display HTML mails. And the problem is that uh, normally you have no problem in filtering JavaScript when you don't need to display HTML. But as you require HTML and need to show HTML tags and so, and so on, uh, it is pretty, um, pretty hard to get out all the JavaScript because JavaScript, there are so many ways to inject JavaScript through an HTML page. For example, it can be in the uh, event handler like on click, on error. It can even be in cascading style sheet files. Uh, you can do all sorts of tricks in order to make the script tag obfuscated. For example, with Internet Explorer 6, there was a vulnerability where you could uh, make the the, what's it called in English? Bitte klammer auf. Angel bracket. Okay, <laughs> yeah, that bracket, and then a null byte, and then script. Um, the browser still uh, recognized it as script tags, but most of the application that filtered out script tags didn't recognize it anymore. So that was a trick that worked a uh, long time with webmail applications. Once you have found a cross-site scripting vulnerability in webmail, all you have to do is send an email to uh, a user that uses the webmail and wait until he opens his mail. When he opens his mail, uh, the JavaScript is executed in his browser and you can do the classic, namely steal the document .cookie. As uh, in the cookies, mostly the session IDs are stored. You can have his session ID and at least while the session is open, um, you can take over his session and read all his emails. Um, the second method was already mentioned uh, at the beginning of the presentation, which is via online banking. Uh, another fun way is to, for example, use exactly the sheet or wire some money via online banking. Um, and when the user logs in next time, the JavaScript gets active and uh, stays active in the background. Uh, we'll see later on how this can work, for example. Um, and when the user does his next payment, you just in the background change the amount and the destination account of his uh, wire and instead of paying his electricity bill, for example, uh, he pays you an arbitrary amount. Um, Cross-site scripting has another advantage, as it is uh, executed on the client and not on the server, you can basically do anything the client does, uh, which is, for example, surf on the internet. Um, 
there is a nice way, uh, which was actually only recently found, uh, called anti-DNS painting, um, to get to the uh, victim's intranet pages and surf on the intranet from remote. Uh, how this works is that most browsers have um, a way of preventing or enforcing the same origin policy by a method called DNS pinning. DNS pinning means that whenever a domain uh, is resolved to its IP address, the IP address remains in the cache of the browser, and even though the domain has a, a short time to live uh, and the IP address for the domain is updated, the browser still uses the old IP address in order to enforce the same origin policy. There's one small trick that uh, enables the the attacker, however, to circumvent this DNS pinning, and it's called anti-DNS pinning, surprisingly, um, which works like this. First, the user um, requests a page from www.attacker.com or whatever, which can be uh, also a page that has been taken over by an attacker. Um, any compromised website, any web page from a company that wants to harm his customers, whatever. Um, the DNS server returns the uh, IP address for this domain, and the browser requests makes a request to the makes a request to the IP address, uh, and loads the page. The page does nothing else but request itself again a couple of seconds later. In the meantime, however, the DNS server changes the IP address for the domain. For example, to something local like 197.168.1.1. Let's just say the internet is located there. Um, and uh, so when the page reloads itself, for example, via JavaScript, um, the browser, due to DNS pinning, requests the old uh, IP address. However, the attacker, in the meantime, closed the HTTP port on the old IP address, which can be, for example, uh, done via dynamically created IP tables rules, so that exactly one um, IP address isn't allowed to, to get on the HTTP port anymore. And when the browser can't reach the HTTP port of the old IP address, he's going to refresh the IP address. Uh, the refreshed IP address is now the local IP address from the intranet. Um, the browser requests www.attacker.com, uh, thinks it, it's still the old site within the internet, uh, internet somewhere, but in reality it is uh, located on the internet. Using JavaScript or cross-site scripting, um, the attacker can now read the content of the internet and send it via JavaScript to his server and have a look at all the internet pages that are uh, located at the client site. So, um, yeah, this can be exploited, as I said, just place the according scripts uh, on any arbitrary server, and anyone who surfaces this web page um, has his internet uh, read if the uh, attacker knows the IP address of the internet. You can also port scan the internet using cross-site scripting or JavaScript uh, simply by loading images from various ports of internal IP addresses. Um, via JavaScript, the attacker has to measure the time how long it took this, uh, the browser to issue an error message. If it takes very long, he knows the port has been cl uh, is closed. Uh, if there is a fast error, uh, the uh, attacker knows either it is an HTTP port and the image didn't exist there, uh, or alternatively the port is open but it's not an HTTP server, then uh, the error message also comes pretty fast. There's actually quite a difference, a number of seconds, so it's pretty easy to tell if a port is open or closed. Another classic is the cross-site scripting phishing. If anyone finds a cross-site scripting vulnerability on a banking site, um, JavaScript can be used via, for example, document.write uh, to exchange large parts of the uh, site. One trick, for example, is to simply change the action tag of the login form or the action parameter of the login form. Uh, so when a user enters his uh, account number and his uh, PIN to log into his online banking account instead of sending it to the banking server. It is sent to a server uh, from the attacker and this doesn't even require to take over some sessions or something like that, but instead the real um, account number and the PIN in clear text is sent to the attacker. 
One way that we are going to talk about now a little bit longer is remotely controlling the victim's browser. Um, we had the idea that it would be great uh, to make an, a JavaScript malware, something like a Trojan horse, which is implemented in JavaScript and which infects uh, the user whenever he surfaces a page where the uh, JavaScript is loaded. Um, all the information that the user does during his uh, session in the browser should be locked and sent to the server. So using such a malware, it would be possible to, for example, lock the key presses that were done in the window, uh, steal all the cookies, and even have a look at the pages uh, the victim is surfing on. This is possible because the power of JavaScript. Uh, JavaScript has a lot of features that can be exploited for such an attack by any attacker. For example, there's key, uh, there's event handlers. You all know in your HTML, you always have these on click, on key press, on error, on whatever, on load. Uh, there's lots of event handlers and you can all catch them. So whenever, for example, someone makes a click somewhere in the window, this can be recorded via JavaScript. Um, and then in turn sent back to the server in order to uh, follow the user. Uh, it is also possible to remotely control the browser. Uh, there's nothing more simple than just setting the location of the browser uh, to any arbitrary page. So whenever a user is infected by this malware, you can just uh, send him to any location he wants. Um, and as the JavaScript is loaded on the page, the victim visits, the same origin policy is uh, completely circumvented. This makes it on the one hand possible to access the cookies because only JavaScript, because JavaScript, sorry, can only cook, uh, access cookies from the domain where the JavaScript is loaded from. And on the other hand, via history.back, uh, the attacker can even read the browser history, at least of the domain from where the uh, JavaScript was loaded. OK, so when we had this idea to write some JavaScript malware, at first we did some requirements engineering. What should such a malware uh, be able to do? The first thing is um, the most important, but as we're going to see, not so quite so simple uh, requirement is that once a victim visits a web page that contains the JavaScript, uh, the web browser should become infected. And at least during the session while uh, the, the user browses in this single window without changing uh, the address bar, um, the malware shall remain active. Another requirement, which is basically clear, but is not so simple sometimes, is that the JavaScript that is used should be cross-browser compatible. Um, actually, JavaScript should be standardized, uh, but it isn't. There's a lot of exceptions. There's uh, some bugs in some browsers that need to be circumvented. So this was one of the requirements that was pretty hard to find out uh, what browser requires what uh, special treatment. Um, a very easy requirement is that all cookies that are set on the victim should be sent to uh, the attacker. This is the classical document.cookie exploit, usually done via cross-site scripting. Um, a little bit more complicated and also a little bit more fun is key presses should be intercepted and locked. Um, so whenever the user enters uh, his username and his password, all the keys are pressed uh, or whenever a key is pressed, an event handler is called, and this event handler should lock all the keys uh, and send them again to the attacker, which makes it actually um, useless to steal the cookies because if you have the username and the password, uh, you don't need the cookies any longer because the cookies are, um, or the session ID is restricted to a session and using the username and password, you can log in whenever you want. All right, now a rather 
hard requirement also was that the malware should be able to work across links on the same domain, which is clear. This is uh, a very important requirement because otherwise uh, the malware would be just active on the first page and whenever the user clicks uh, another link, the malware wouldn't be active again. So it was clear that it is required that while the user serves on one domain, the malware needs to remain um, active. Another hard requirement was that the malware should be able to work across domains. So even when the user leaves his current domain, uh, for example, he's surfing on um, www.decker.com, and he goes to another page, say Microsoft.com, the malware should remain in the background uh, and still keep sending all the information uh, to the attacker. Of course, we want to do, to do remote shoulder surfing. That means that um, you know, shoulder surfing, someone is surfing his browser and you're looking above his shoulder what he's looking at, uh, perhaps reading his emails and something like that. Um, you should be able to do this with a JavaScript malware too, but only not only a couple of centimeters behind him, but rather a couple of hundred kilometers away uh, via cross-site scripting or JavaScript. And finally, uh, it should be possible to remotely control infected browsers. All right, so now let's come to the implementation. We actually implemented an alpha, alpha, alpha version of this um, JavaScript malware. I'm going to show you something uh, of it at the end of the presentation. But let's just first have a look uh, how we did it, what uh, problems we had to uh, implement such a system. Um, well, as I already said, the, to get the uh, victim infected is not as easy as it sounds. The beginning is pretty simple. You need to load some JavaScript. For example, we placed a JavaScript, uh, xt.js, on a server, and uh, all you need to inject into the client are these short tags. And uh, this makes the victim load the JavaScript and become infected. Now, the problem is that we want to have it client server based so that the server is able to send commands to the client. Uh, problem is, this is not the way the HTTP protocol works because normally only the client can initiate connections to the server. It's not possible for an HTTP server to request something from a client. So the solution is actually pretty simple and I think one, the only one that is possible, namely polling. Every couple of seconds, uh, the victim pulls JavaScript from the client and um, if there is something for the client to do, uh, the server changes the JavaScript that is pulled from the server um, and the client does whatever the server tells him. Commands that can be executed might be, for example, uh, execute some JavaScript on the client, tell the, the client to display an alert box showing you have been owned or whatever. Uh, get me my cookies, get me my key presses, or I want to see what you're currently looking at. Um, in order to handle multiple clients, of course it should be possible uh, you want to infect not only one client and control him, but you want to infect uh, quite a number of clients. Basically this can be uh, anything and is dependent on how much traffic there is on the uh, web page that has been compromised via cross-site scripting. It is required to have a unique ID in order to identify the clients. Okay, the next requirement, all cookies uh, sent to the client in, uh, while infected should be intercepted. This is basically uh, a very easy one. Every next time the client pulls from the server, just tell the client to send top get out the window document cookie to the sender. Get out the window is actually a custom function we implemented. It does nothing else but go through all the frames. There may be stacked frames uh, and in order to get the cookies from the top window, so to say, uh, we just use this function. And then uh, send the cookies to uh, the server so that he can have a look at it. Um, a little bit more tricky is, as I already mentioned, logging the key presses. Um, in theory, we would have to put on key press, uh, on key press handlers on anything. 
um, form tags and whatever. But luckily there's a great feature in HTML, um, namely on keypress can be uh, added to the body tag. And then whenever within the window someone presses a window, uh, a key, the key press is locked simply with one usage um, of the event handler. So we get the uh, content of the HTML via window document party passed node in the HTML and via regular expression we replace the body tag or better we just add uh, an event handler on key brace is, uh, is key ff event where event is just a variable where various information about the event is stored. A mini uh, key ff is just a mini uh, JavaScript keylogger. Um, this is one of the examples we had to overcome uh, with browser incompatibility. Uh, Internet Explorer, for example, has another uh, member of the, ob of the event object that stores the key code uh, with Internet Explorer. It is event.keycode with any other browser. It's e.wish. Uh, which, um, all right, then we just reverse the character by uh, getting the character from the char code and append to a global variable. We call, just call document all keys the character that has been pressed. Um, getting the key information is exactly the same as with cookies. Next time the client polls, um, we just have him return all keys to the server. Now, finally, there's a little bit um, more interested requirement because it's a little bit harder, namely that uh, the malware should be able to work across links on the same page. The solution is, again, not so difficult. We can use uh, XML HTTP requests. It's great. One of the few great things about Ajax is that we are now able to do arbitrary uh, HTTP requests via JavaScript. Um, just like with window, uh, with, with on key press, we add another event handler to the body tag, namely on click. And whenever a click takes place in the window, uh, it is called by the click FF event. What comes in handy uh, is additionally that there is a some call it vulnerability, I wouldn't call it that. Um, but when someone uh, points his mouse uh, pointer over a link, um, the archref uh, attribute from the link tag is shown in the status bar. Um, it is not shown what is in the on click. So when you point a mouse over a link, uh, you think to see what kind of page is loaded in the status bar, uh, but via on click you can just point the browser to basically <coughs> anything via JavaScript. This was a big thing in 2004. Microsoft even advised to better type in URLs, uh, URLs instead of clicking on them. Um, yeah. What happens now when uh, a mouse button is pressed? The simple case is a normal link was pressed. In this case, just use JavaScript to gauge the href uh, attribute and the target attribute. We want to be compatible with frames. So even if it's a frame, uh, a, fr a page that uses frames, we want to show the page in the correct target uh, and perform a simple XML HTTP GET request um, and put the output of the request, so the response uh, to body parent node in a HTML of the right target. This has two implications. The first one being that the uh, URL in the browser bar will not change while you are infected. Uh, it will look to the client as the as if the browser always is on the same domain uh, because just the content of the body tag uh, is exchanged depending on what page you're currently on. This makes another problem, <coughs> namely that relative path may be wrong. So if you go to another subdirectory, um, the images that are loaded via relative path, for example, won't be able to load anymore, but there's a simple um, solution to this, namely the base tag. 
and uh, via the rtref attribute you can just give him the new relative path from where to load all the images which makes it easy because now the browser is handling the relative links and we don't need to do that anymore. The complex case is if a form button was pressed. We also want to be able for the malware to stay alive even though uh, a form was submitted. Um, luckily, we already have our on-click handler. So um, the event object tells us in which form the uh, the submit button was pressed. Uh, now we need to to loop through all the elements of the uh, form because our on-click event handler um, <coughs> prevented the form from actually submitting. So unfortunately, we can't use xform.elements because for some reasons, some strange reasons, it doesn't contain all uh, form elements, but rather we have to manually get all input elements, all text areas, and all select boxes, for example, with um, with checkboxes or, or radio buttons. All right, then we just do the XML HTTP request and again setting the inner HTML to whatever the request returned. Okay, um, this is possible when the user clicks on um, a link that shows to the same domain. But due to the same origin uh, policy, which is basically a good thing, um, XML HTTP requests won't um, allow requests to alien domains or other domains. Um, the solution to this is that the server, of course, can uh, request anything it wants. So therefore, whenever the infected client leaves the current domain, we just send uh, the server a message that we need to, that he needs to request a page for us. For example, um, post type, here we pass in the URL, uh, the URL, and uh, the, the browser, uh, the, the server takes care of requesting the page and uh, returning the input, and again, the inner HTML is just set to uh, send to the client for display. Finally, we want to do remote shoulder surfing. That's again a very easy one. Uh, all we need to do is to continuously um, send the top document body pass uh, parent node in a HTML to the server, and the server just can display it within an iframe. Okay, and the final requirement was to remotely control infected browsers. Actually, I would have loved to show you this live, but unfortunately, my VMware let me down today in the morning. So I quickly made a couple of screenshots. I know it's not the same as a live performance, but I'm sure you will see uh, what the, the system we implemented is about uh, from the screenshots. So this is just a plain screenshot from our control page. Um, you have on the left side the victims, and in the middle, the active module, and on the right side, a couple of modules, what you can do with the browsers that have been if, uh, infected. For example, you can send him an arbitrary uh, JavaScript command, you can uh, get the remote page, you can get the cookies, you can set the page to anything the server wants, you can uh, set the page location, uh, you can set the page content here, you can set the page location. Uh, the alpha indicates that it's not very good, well working so far, but we're always working on improving the system. Um, then we have uh, kill victims browser, for example, using some denial of service vulnerabilities uh, in the browsers. You can also crash the browser if you want to. Uh, and finally, you can get the key presses. All right, so this is just a very, very simple um, web application we wrote for demonstration purposes. It is actually vulnerable to all kinds of vulnerabilities. You have cross-site scripting, you have SQL injection, you have file inclusion, file uploads, everything you want to. I'm just using this application uh, to show you how the proposed system works. 
it's actually a gambling site, so you can play uh, roulette or whatever you want on this page online. It's not online. We wouldn't put uh, such a vulnerable system online. Uh, it just ran um, on a different server, internal server. Okay, so into this application, we inserted um, a small JavaScript, namely the one that loads the JavaScript Trojan. Uh, it's as simple as putting the script tag there. Uh, in this case, we just assume we found a, uh, a permanent uh, cross-site scripting vulnerability. If you only have uh, a dynamic uh, or non-permanent uh, cross-site scripting vulnerability, you need your victims to press on a link, for example. Okay, now the uh, victim visited the page and becomes effective, which is shown as uh, such an entry to the victim's list. You know what kind of browser you have, and um, in this case, we're just sending the client um, a manual message, namely alert you have been owned. You just press the execute button, and the victim um, gets the, the message that he has been owned. Um, you can also get the cookies as shown here. Uh, down there you can see the cookies. Um, you can get the screenshot. This is what I call remote shoulder surfing. Uh, just press get page snapshot or permanently get uh, page snapshot and you can always see what pages the victim is surfing on uh, and follow him around anywhere. Okay, it also works with two clients, for example. You just have two entries uh, in this area here. And as you can see, we were on a different page before. Whenever the victim changes the page, the page changes too in uh, our control page of the cross-site scripting church. Um, okay, now you can also log into this portal using a username and a password um, and submit it which is great because this can demonstrate our get pre key press um, functionality. In this example, um, I used control paste, control V uh, before it was even locked, but you see uh, the username I used was gek and the password was passwd um, exclamation mark. Okay, now even though uh, the client logged in, we're still active with our get page snapshot and now we as attacker are logged in too and see everything the user sees logged in as the user that has been infected. Um, now we have an external link just to demonstrate to you that the uh, system uh, is able to work across uh, domains, which points to www.seconsult.com, and uh, the, URL stay, uh, the URL stays the same, but it is loaded the page that uh, the external page that the client went to, and still you can get uh, the screenshot. Okay, and you can also point the server, uh, the client to another page location, for example, DeepSec. Yes, it says alpha for a reason there. Um, and you can send arbitrary content to uh, the client. Well, that's it from my side. Just in time, as I see. Uh, any questions? Excuse me? Does it work if the screen saver is enabled? If the screen saver is enabled, uh, well actually the screen saver doesn't have any impact on uh, the page. So uh, it's just a matter of the browser. Whenever the user manually enters another URL, uh, the malware becomes in ineffective because the new page is loaded. Uh, but the screen saver doesn't have an impact on the Trojan itself. You considered implementing something like a proxy server that gets you uh, a view of the internet from outside? Mm, not yet. Not, no, not yet. Really, uh, 
That's true. The, the problem with uh, getting the intranet is that you have to, in some way, brute force the IP address of the intranet. Because you don't know, or another way would be uh, there's a vulnerability where you can get the history by brute forcing the links, just showing a huge list of links and uh, checking what color the link is. And if the link was already visited, uh, it is another color. That would be, for example, a way. Yeah, actually, it's a good idea. <laughs> Right? Anyone? Well, thanks everyone for listening. <laughs>